right, y'all, what is going on? So I just wanted to come on here for a quick second before the video and say I really hope you all enjoy my interview with Dr. Ford. I said this during the discussion, and no offense to any of my previous guests. Don't get me wrong. I love all my interviews and all my interviewees, but this interview with Dr. Ford is my favorite interview. I love Dr. Ford's passion. I loved his, just the knowledge that he had about this subject, being a teacher at St. Ticon's, or I should say professor, being a professor at St. Ticon's for 35 years. Apologies, you're probably hearing my little girl in the background. Um, but but my favorite, my favorite interview by far, I loved his passion, the knowledge of this man uh, was amazing. We had a, a very fun conversation from the get go, from the moment that he entered the studio to the end, whenever we jumped off, it was, it, it was phenomenal. I hope, I hope that I have that kind of passion being within orthodoxy. And he probably has been in orthodoxy now for, for much longer than 35 years. Um, but I, but I hope I can have that kind of passion once I get to where, to where Dr. Ford is. And so I hope you all enjoy Dr. Dr. David Ford is, is a phenomenal man. And so with that being said, enjoy the interview and, uh, I hope you learn something like I did during this interview. So without further ado, my interview with Dr. David Ford. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a special episode of Faith Unaltered. I am your host, Tyler Fowler. Accompanying me today is Saint Tecon, Professor St. Tecon's Orthodox Seminary, Dr. David Ford. Dr. Ford, how are you doing today, sir? Doing very well. Thank you, Tyler. Absolutely, absolutely. So I invited Dr. Ford on to discuss a very interesting topic, a topic that we have not talked about yet, on our 400 episodes of Faith Unaltered. I'm surprised we haven't got to this yet, but we're here now, we're finally arrived at our destination. And that topic is universalism or universal salvation. There were some interesting videos put out by a ministry that I will not mention, though I'm sure some of you can guess who that is. And uh, I got to questioning some things about this concept. And so I was recommended by a friend, a priest, a uh, clergy friend of mine, uh, that Dr. Ford had written a letter. So, uh, Father Joseph Gleason, I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yes, Are you? I am. Awesome. Yeah. He recommended me you, and I said, let's do it. And so, uh, Dr. Ford, since you've never been on our show before, this is your first time, I'll give you a few moments to introduce yourself, and you, the mic is yours. Have at it. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, I've been teaching at St. Ticon's for 35 years now um, in the uh, teaching the church history courses here. Um, <clears throat> my story is <laughs> pretty interesting. Uh, raised nominal Presbyterian, then okay. coming into the charismatic movement in the midst of that, going to Oral Roberts University in the late seventies oh, wow. and uh, in their um, seminary program, mm -hmm. newly uh, put together. And lo and behold, one of the professors was an Eastern Orthodox Christian. Wow. He he just raised the curtain, you know, on the yeah. history of the early church, which I was uh, totally unfamiliar with. And uh, it, it, it just won my heart. Mm -hmm. uh, learning about uh, those centuries uh, where the to see that the institutional, hierarchical, liturgical, sacramental church was alive and well you know Amen. all those centuries uh the holy spirit had not ever left uh, our lord's church and i wasn't the only one about 10 others of us uh so we were um uh learning about orthodoxy together and uh five of those uh fellows uh became uh priests in the antiochian archdiocese okay because dr williams was in that uh diocese and uh the church in tulsa there uh where we uh started experiencing the liturgy was uh in the antiochian archdiocese okay yes all right so i'm just very curious off the top uh, just off oh. the top 
Sure. Why? So what was it about church history that led you? Now, have you been, you said 35 years at St. Tecons. Have you been teaching yes. church history that long? Yes. Okay. So what was it about church history that drew you to that specific topic? Well, um, just really kind of starting from the question, what happened after the book of Acts? Yeah. You know, which is our church's first history book. Um, and seeing that uh, uh, really the, the next step uh, in the literature, of course, is the Apostolic Fathers, St. Saint, Saint Clement of Rome, St. Polycarp of Smyrna, and St. Ignatius of Antioch, reading their writings and uh, seeing the great emphasis on Christ's divinity, for one thing, great emphasis on the sacraments uh, already unfolding, the development of the threefold ministry, deacon, priest, and bishop. Uh, then we move into the, uh, of course, the history of the persecutions and uh, so uh, inspiring in themselves, these Christians willing to die for their faith in Christ. Yeah. Um, then the uh, getting into the seven ecumenical councils, the uh, great efforts to, uh, refute and repulse uh, the heresies. So you you start to see, wow, correct doctrine really is mighty important. Yeah. Um, uh, and the lives of the, of the martyrs, the lives of the uh, great church fathers, um, you know, all together. And, and, and then, and also I would say very important, learning about the sacramental worldview, mm -hmm. uh, which under, Girds our Orthodox understanding of the sacraments. You know that uh, uh, bread and wine, water and oil, uh, all these things from the natural order automatically bring or uh, uh, have, have a basis in, uh, as Father Schmemann says, a natural sacramentality, a natural holiness, because everything in creation is so good, made by the good God, right? Yes. Who loves mankind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So all these things together, I would say. Um, and then and then just unfolding the story century by century. And uh, finally making uh, kind of the objective comparison mm -hmm. of all the various expressions of Christianity in the world today, uh, which expression most closely looks like, let's say, the church of the fourth century, you know, sure. after the era of persecutions, when the church can really come out in the open, great cathedrals can be built, uh, monasticism takes shape, mm -hmm. the first two ecumenical councils are in the fourth century, the great Cappadocian fathers, uh, mm -hmm. along with St. Athanasius the Great, um, in terms of uh, liturgy, in terms of doctrine, in terms of spiritual life and in terms of hierarchical structure. Uh, those four categories, I would suggest, um, use those to uh, uh, just simply look at the various expressions of Christianity in the world today. And it becomes readily apparent that only Holy Orthodoxy is in line with the church of the uh, first, four, first four centuries especially as we see it through the lens of those uh, four characteristics. Sure, sure. Yeah. No, absolutely. absolutely. And it seems like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. the fourth yeah. century, that almost seems like the golden age for the church because that's when the persecutions end. This yes. is whenever theologians can actually theologian <laughs> and, and we get With some of those freedom. greatest. Yeah, absolutely. With more freedom. Yeah. And yeah. it seems like that's where we start really getting a systematization of the doctrines of the church. Is that fair or does that come before or after? You're the professor of church history. I'm here to learn. <laughs> but but how would you describe that? Well, uh, when you use the word systemization, of okay. course, um, it's not really such an orthodox thing right. to uh, have to produce systematic theologies. Mm -hmm. Um Actually, very few of the church fathers have ever have ever done that. Um, Origen really was the first to attempt that, and we'll we'll talk about him. Not a church father, sure. Um, 
St. John of Damascus, his exposition of the Orthodox faith is probably the closest thing we have to that. It's it's remarkable <laughs> how short it is, for one thing. Sure. And, and uh, also how he starts with uh, uh, a wonderful kind of uh, uh, ex- explanation, in a sense, of how God is and, all, and these doctrines are ultimately all beyond explanation, mm-hmm. you know. So uh, we we really have kind of a natural reticence to try to pin down, you know, to try to figure out the mysteries. Uh, every heresy we can say is an effort to bring the mysteries of the faith down to the level of human reasoning. Yeah. And of course, we know from the scriptures uh, the Lord says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You know, uh, Proverbs even says, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So we are very aware of the limitations of human reasoning. Yeah. Yeah. All so right. We, we say what we can, you know, really, um, in the whole sweep of things, the church seems to uh, only address certain uh, theological issues when the uh, standard uh, teaching, as expressed especially in the liturgy, uh, is challenged, you know, mm-hmm. by uh, heretical views. And that's what brings about the first ecumenical council, kind of the, the classic uh, prototype, of course, in the line of uh, uh, the first council in Jerusalem described in Acts 15. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was the Arian challenge. You know, that drew the church together to address uh, his speculation that Christ was really not fully divine, that he was really simply a, uh, uh, a, a creature, right. a great being. And uh, the beauty is that uh, this forces the church to delve more deeply into the mystery. Um, and, uh, of course, the Nicene Creed, the, the miracle of the creed, comes forth and and with the key uh word there homoousius yeah interestingly you know drawn from the philosophical tradition but given a totally christian meaning right mm-hmm. that's that, right uh, that uh the son of god is fully uh of the same essence as god the father sure Yes, sure. Homoousia said, I know it was used in pagan literature, but I like the Nicene, the, well, the Nicene Council because there's this idea that me and a co-host of mine talk about, and that's the idea of redeeming. Redeeming is, seems to be anyway, the center of Christianity and what God is working in his world to redeem it. And so yeah. I am fair yeah. with redeeming symbols, with redeeming words, with yeah. redeeming all of these different things. And I think the Council of Nicaea is a beautiful example of that, that someone can just point to and say, this is what I'm talking about. Yes. Right. So, all right. Well, let's uh, let's let's go ahead and jump in. Like I said, uh, Dr. Ford, I appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule oh. to be here with me today to talk my, about universalism. My, uh, my joy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, So my first question, really, because we haven't done an episode on this topic specifically, I think it's appropriate to begin with definitions. Um, So, Dr. Ford, how would you personally define Christian universalism or universal salvation? Mm -hmm. Yes, in one line, (laughs) I would say that Christian universalism is the erroneous opinion that ultimately— every human being, every sentient being, including then uh, the angels, the fallen angels, every demon, even the devil himself, will be saved. Mm -hmm. And it seems that um, this view hinges on three false presuppositions, uh, among probably others. But let me just uh, share these uh, three. Uh, Forgive me for uh, referring to notes here. Oh, no, fair enough. Okay, thanks. Uh, This view hinges on, first, the false supposition that repentance will be possible after death and will extend for as long as it takes in the next life. No matter how long it takes, they say, each and every soul will eventually 
willingly accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior. This view also hinges on the a second false assumption that if God is truly loving, he would never create beings, both visible and invisible, who might never accept his love and redemption and hence perish in eternal torment. And uh, the third presupposition, uh, the assumption that the demons and even Satan himself will ever want to admit their wickedness <laughs> and repent and be saved. Sure. Sure. Fair enough. Um, so now you use the word erroneous. Is that normally the way that the Orthodox Church as a whole defines universalism? Is that your your personal view? How, how would you categorize those two things? Uh-huh. No, it's it's definitely the view of the church. Okay. Uh, the consensus of the church fathers clearly rejects Christian universalism. Okay. The Orthodox Church understands St. Paul, for, for instance, indicating there's no possibility of repentance after death, addressing that first uh, false presupposition. Mm -hmm. uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And putting this along with Hebrews 9, 27, which says, It is appointed for men to die once, and then the judgment. But Tyler, let me add here, yeah. the church would say that even if there were or is the chance for repentance after salvation, mm -hmm. there's no guarantee that everyone who has refused the Lord's love in this life, and especially the demons and the devil himself, where's the guarantee that they would ever, every one of them, ever no matter how long the eons are infinitely, uh, you know, uh, would ever indeed come to accept and act on such a possibility yeah. to renounce their hatred of the Lord and finally accept his love and salvation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems to me like you don't even, so with the scripture and with tradition, there's not a hint of that. It seems like Satan specifically. So let's just, let's just focus on him. I know there are some universalists that would claim, well, we don't talk about the devil. We don't know. We're only talking about people whenever we say that everyone will be saved. But let's let's hit on that uh, on Satan real quick. There is no hint, to my knowledge. Now, correct me if I'm wrong on this, Doctor Ford. But to my knowledge, there is no hint that Satan has a repentant heart. Would even right. think about repenting within right. the scripture, within the tradition. Right. This guy is as evil as he can get, and yeah. yeah. We don't see him having that mindset. There's not a glimpse of it. Yeah, very, very true. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, let, let's just go ahead then to a story Yeah. Um, that, that confirms this. Please. Um, St. Saint Paisio, Saint Paisios, the new of Mount Athos. I heard mm -hmm. this very recently. Um, at one point, he had so much love for all of creation, so burning a desire for all to be saved, including the devil and his demons, yeah. that he prayed strenuously for seven days for the salvation of the devil and all the demons. At that point, he saw a little devil, like a gremlin, <laughs> smiling wickedly at him, uh -huh. mocking him. Yet, undeterred, he continued to pour out his heart to the all-loving Lord for a few more days, to save the devil and all the demons. And then the devil said to him, what makes you think I would ever want to be saved? Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and you know, Tyler, we're, we are not ever exhorted to pray for the devil or, or, or the demons. Right. And, uh, and the saints in all their centuries, uh, all the centuries of intense prayer, spiritual experience there's never been a single instance of a saint experiencing one of the demons repenting wow I mean, it seems know, like is... <laughs> go, go ahead yeah go ahead. no this is the this is the church's experience right and it seems like and i don't want to be I, I, so i'm generalizing here so it seems like what we do have from the fathers 
is that like what I said a while ago is that the demons for lack of better words job it is is to draw people away from God yeah. not to lead him lead people to him yes. in a sense yes. um so okay yeah including wow. including deceit deception delusion right, right? what's right. the first what's the first delusion the first lie of the devil mm -hmm. it's often said that he doesn't exist right, right. yeah yeah so we and need we, to be aware of this uh, uh right of these tactics of the of the of the evil one that's right and if you don't believe the devil is deceptive for any of my audience watching this just look out into the world and see what's happening right now really? and this is everywhere not just the united states but everywhere yeah. the devil is deceptive y'all and uh yeah. all right that yes. that's interesting i'm glad you brought up that story because it leads me really into my next question um so watching the 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 video and the youtube channel that will remain unnamed um it's there were some interviews on there talking about the fifth ecumenical council specifically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the condemnation of origin by name mm -hmm. and my question is given what now let me just ask this before i get into this did the fifth ecumenical council condemn or label as heresy universalism or universal salvation yeah i think there is definitely a, a certain question uh mm -hmm. about whether universalism itself was specifically condemned um but we can absolutely <laughs> we know for sure that um uh, origin was condemned in his writings and in his person and we could we could talk about uh, uh how that came about as uh, uh as a last resort for the protection of the flock mm -hmm. from uh originistic heresies people who were taking some of his speculations too far affirming them trying to claim they were absolute truth yeah. and uh you know causing great uh havoc uh, especially among the monks in in egypt uh, uh as it as it happened um but um yes um because of uh the problems with originism um he was condemned in his his writings across the board and uh, and his uh, person. Now, of course, that doesn't mean every single thing he wrote was wrong. Sure, but it was a an extremely um, important pastoral step the church decided in council, led by the Holy Spirit, um, to steer people away from origin. You know, just too confusing, too much of a possibility to get misled. And honestly, if I could just add, yeah, of I, course. I, I personally believe that Origen was so much of a Christian that he would have said at the Fifth Council, okay, if this, if you all deem this necessary to condemn me, uh, my writings, and even personally, please do it. I would rather die for. Uh, the well-being of the flock. I, I would rather perish myself than to have any of the flock be oh, misled wow. by any of my speculations. Okay. I All really right. believe that. St. Paul, you know, says he would rather die right. uh, and, and perish that his people, the Jews, would live. I believe Origen would have had that same kind of spirit. Yeah, Romans 9, I believe that's that's directly from where yes. St. Paul talks about that. Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> yeah. with that, so... Do, it seems like this is to be the case then it, could there have been an option and i and i know granted the fifth ecumenical the fifth ecumenical council is long after origin reposed yes. but would there have been an option for him to repent oh in a scenario yeah. like that if he were alive or would they would just <laughs> just been like nope off with your head no no, <laughs> no. okay okay we don't know no one knows the Right, part, right, right. This is yeah, speculation, of course, of course. Sure. Of course, we don't know uh, Origins' heart. Um, he, let's let's talk a little more about him. He in yeah. in his in his introduction to on first principles. Yeah. Um, his great work, which was his his effort at a systematic theology, going doctrine by doctrine. Okay. Uh, discussing uh, the doctrines in a certain logical order. He says in his three or four page introduction that uh, 
everywhere the church has um, decided on certain questions, theological questions, uh, of course, he is fully accepting those uh, conclusions. But he says there are some areas such as where did souls come from uh, that uh, he he's accurately observes the church as a whole has not addressed that question, mm -hmm. has not come to a, a firm conclusion. At least that was his understanding. Sure. Uh, so he says uh, there must be room for people trying to be led by the Holy Spirit to uh, think about these things and come up with some tentative conclusions. Mm -hmm. I think that basically was his heart. Of course, you know, he was absolutely brilliant and uh, his mind just keeps turning and turning. He said to have written something like 6,000 works. Uh, wow. And I, I think it was a real battle for him to, to try to stay humble. Um, and um, the other thing we really have to remember is that he is writing in the first half of the third century, mm -hmm. which is a, a full hundred years before the first ecumenical council. So um, many, uh, many issues, many certain, many questions um, really, you know, in the whole uh, sweep of church history were addressed more fully than they had been in origins time. Yeah. So as long as he's offering his speculations as tentative, Sure. Then there's no problem, right? I right. mean, even even Arius, uh, Christology. Uh, who is this Jesus Christ? How can he really be fully God and fully man? It was a question, and yeah. Arius, you know, uh, relying on some human thinking, as I kind of mentioned earlier. That's right. Uh, uh, staggered at the idea that this carpenter from Galilee, from Nazareth, really could have been God himself. Yeah. Uh, easier to think of him as uh, simply uh, some kind of created being. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, if he had just simply offered those, uh, his conclusions tentatively, he comes to the Nicene Council. Uh, the judgment is, is uh, unanimous, which is absolutely staggering. 318 uh, men agreeing on the same thing. That's hard. Well, that's hard to, to do. Led, <laughs> has to be led by the Holy Spirit, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So if he had humbly accepted the verdict of the council, uh, there would have not been uh, the, uh, the the condemnation of the, the, he he would have repented and everything right. would have been fine with him, but he did not repent, and um, of course, tragically, we know that uh, uh, his. Uh, varying degrees of his thinking, various uh, manifestations of it did linger and cause havoc in the church for another 55 years That's right. or so until the second council, mm -hmm. which by reaffirming the Nicene council finally does put an end to uh, Arianism. And we really have to credit very much St. Athanasius the Great mm -hmm who uh, writes massively against Arianism he, during his exile uh, in the 350s. And he's the one who breaks the back intellectually of Arianism. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a, a massive effort and we thank him mightily for it. Yeah. But, you know, going back to your idea of redemption, mm -hmm. uh, St. Athanasius in his work uh, on the incarnation uh, is a very early work written in his 20s before Arianism really exploded on yeah. the scene. He, he makes the beautiful, uh, uses the beautiful analogy of a master painter whose work, his masterpiece is uh, damaged mm -hmm. and who can fix it? Who right. can bring it back to how it was originally? Only the master himself. Only God. Right? That's right. Yeah, only God himself can restore the image that was uh, so uh, damaged went out mm -hmm. and he fell. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love I love the restored icon model that yes. Saint Athanasius oh, yeah. argues for. Now, was j just kind of getting off topic a little bit. Oh, was sure. Saint Athanasius sure. a deacon at the time he wrote the Incarnation? Yeah. Okay, he was. Yes, he was. Okay, in his twenties, 
and he was a deacon then, still in his 20s at the time of the Nicene Council. Okay. Wow. So, wow. In his 20s. Mm -hmm. I'm 34. Yeah. And I couldn't imagine writing a work like on the incarnation. Well, and that's why I don't have an ST in front of my name. So <laughs> there you go. That oh, makes my. sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, uh, Dr. Ford. No, I, I appreciate all that. And, and you know, the way the way you describe the ecumenical councils and, and just if the repentance would have been there, it would have showed this humility with yeah. areas specifically. But yes. the fact of the matter is he didn't. And that just shows how prideful in one sense anyway the yeah. guy was and so i see why ecumenical councils condemn people rather yeah. than teachings or or it's both and i guess both, I, I could say both. yeah sure uh as as heretical because you've got the chance to repent you don't take it up you've got the whole witness of the holy spirit right there in front of you and you're like nah i know better no yeah. Yeah. no 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 Right. So, okay, you'll you'll hear me ask over and over. Correct me if I'm wrong on this. I, I hope that's the Holy Spirit working Amen. in me. So, <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well stated. All righty. So, with the, so we've talked about a couple guys. Let me jump to question three real quick, and then All we'll right. get back on track. Okay. Um, so a few more names got brought up in the discussions that I was watching, uh, and and these were people that were claimed to be. So, well, let me put it like this. One person said, definitely, these guys are universalist. And then a few other people said, maybe, or they were hopeful, hopeful universalist. And we'll right. talk about that here in a minute, too. Yes, the, names, yeah, good. the names mentioned were Saint, or I don't know if this is a saint or not. So Clement of Alexandria, is he a saint? Well, let's, yeah. no, let's talk about him. He is okay. not actually a saint in our church. Okay. He's, yeah, he is actually... Uh, quite endearing. I, I love him, especially for his very positive view of marriage. Okay. Uh, he has a great holistic understanding of, of the world, the whole world is sacramental mm -hmm. uh, and our calling to bring every tiny detail of our life, you know, under the Lordship of Christ yeah. to be led by the spirit. Um, um, there is some, there are some things uh he said, which uh, may be taken out of context, you put them together, may tilt in that direction. But uh, personally, actually, I was not even aware of that until uh, that uh, video appeared. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, again, very early, actually a little bit earlier than Origin. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and not a saint in our church. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The other names that were mentioned were Gregory of Nyssa, so the Cappadocians yes. that we were talking about, and yes. Gregory Nanzianzus. So both of these guys are obviously saints in our church. What is your view on those guys? Are they concrete universalists, hopeful universalists, or none of the above? Mm. As far as I know, actually, I'm, I'm quite surprised with uh, Gregory Nazianzen Same. being included, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I have... Uh, uh, not that I've read everything he, he wrote, but I have never heard him associated with uh, any form of universalism. Yeah. Um, now, with St. Gregory of Nyssa, and I expected you to, for the next one, to be St. Maximus the Confessor. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah. He, he, uh, th those two really are the, are the main ones, I, uh, it seems okay. uh, to me. They, it's interesting. They are both clearly the most, those two, the most philosophically oriented of okay. all the fathers. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, isn't necessarily a problem. Right. But, you know, the more you think, you know, uh, the more chance there is that you'll do some wrong thinking. Sure. Let's say, you know, yeah. But, yeah. but even there, uh, it's not clear cut uh, that, that uh, okay. either or, or both of them we're actually stating as uh, doctrine, as dogma, mm -hmm. that absolutely it's guaranteed every single sentient, sentient being, including uh, the devil himself, will repent in the end. Sure. It's not clear. Um, some things, uh, especially more so, I think, with uh, St. Greg of Nyssa, uh, maybe tilting in that direction. Um, but um, even so, even if those two were hard, so-called hard uh, 
universalist and, and, and not simply hopeful. Right. Uh, they would simply be considered on the fringe. We never, on those issues, right? We never right. say any saint, any church father was absolutely 100% correct in everything they ever said That's or right. wrote. We never claim that. So, okay, they did some speculating in this certain area and um, the church as a whole rejects it. So that's fine. You know, with our in our love for these fathers, we yeah. just gently put those speculations aside and, uh, and trust the, the consensus of the fathers. Right, right on. All right the on. others who were very clearly uh, not espousing universalism. Yeah, and and that's right. And and yeah. for those who haven't seen this, so so this is more for my audience, really. But we did an episode with Father John Whiteford, Father ah. Joseph Gleason, and a yes. uh, a friend of mine from our parish, uh, Jeremy Conrad. And one of the reasons we keep bringing up through these episodes, and now including this one, the consensus of the fathers is the main reason that they give. And I would love your opinion on this too, Doctor Ford is that once you see consensus within any body, namely the church, though, since we're speaking about, this seems to be the evidence that the Holy Spirit is leading them in that direction for a reason, namely yeah. because it's true. What What are your yes. thoughts on that? Oh, Tyler, absolutely. Okay. We, You know, we, we love the conclusion at the... Uh, in Acts 15, at, at the end of the uh, First Council there in Jerusalem, yeah. you know how uh, St. James, the first bishop of mm -hmm. Jerusalem, obviously, clearly the, uh, the uh, head of that, the, the president, let's say, of that council. How yeah. Remember how he says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit That's right. and to us. Oh, just so beautiful. That's right. And, uh, you know, that, that proto-council there, uh, there was a lot of dispute. Oh. Mm -hmm. And um, then uh, uh, St. Peter and St. Paul gave their testimonies, and that really helped bring consensus. Um, and, uh, and that's what is uh, striven for at all the ecumenical councils, and it comes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it, it's, it's just so remarkable that so many uh, human beings would be in agreement on these ultimate questions so consistently through the centuries, so many sure. different times and places, right? Yeah, yeah. Different backgrounds of these fathers. Oh my, it's, it's well, it has to be the Holy Spirit. It, absolutely, and not only that, you just said the key word, centuries. We see people now, and, and not to talk smack about Protestants, but no. you see doctrine changing within that group, yeah. generations. Yes. This isn't the same beliefs held. Now, some, there are confessional Protestants that, that hold to things like the Westminster Confession of Faith, you know, and, and without change, per se. But even in the Presbyterian Church, we see liberalism starting yeah. to invade. Uh, right. And so you're talking about centuries of the same beliefs held down through the centuries, and yet yeah. the contrast to that is, well, we can't even hold the same <laughs> the same beliefs to the next generation. I can't even pass down these beliefs to my yeah. children because we've got this idea that, well, what's good for you is okay, but this is my belief. And if they contradict, then maybe we can both be right. And no, yeah. Yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> that relativism is, is absolutely unorthodox. Right. Right. And I think we see that evidenced in, in church history. Yes, we sure do. Fair we enough. Sure do. All yes. right. All right, let's let's turn to some scriptures then, and, and I'm very curious because obviously Christian universalism or universal salvation doesn't just pop up out of nowhere. I mean, in Correct. a sense, it kind of sure. does. Yeah, but no. but there's a source in which, and, and unfortunately, that source is the Bible. Um, as you can see, neither Dr. Ford or myself are universalists. <laughs> and so with that being said, but 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 there are passages that some try to interpret in that way, namely... 1 Timothy 2, 4, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and Romans 5, 18. And now we, we can go back and hit those one by one if you'd like to, uh, Dr. Ford. But I'm just curious, how does the church interpret these passages that universalists often cite 
to quote unquote support their model of salvation. Mm-hmm. What what is our response to that? Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's let's just go ahead and address these. Yeah. First uh, Timothy two four, it's the it's God's will that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, it's God's will, right? Christ died for all of us, <laughs> not just some. You know, right. as as uh, limited atonement would, would the five point Calvinism, the third one, limited atonement. No, sure. absolutely, he died for all. Saint John, of course, Saint John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, but we're still sinful. I mm-hmm. mean, you know. We, there has to be an understanding of a proper interpretation. Of course, with uh, with Christ's salvific work, we make the very important distinction, all the fathers do, between nature and person, right? Usia and hypostasis. So we understand that uh, Christ assumes all of human nature in his incarnation, right? And redeems it all. But um, it's up to each hypostasis then each of us with our free will to accept his salvation or not. And um, I like to point out in my class, um, we know that with Christ, his hypostasis, his, the center of his being, right? Who he is, the who, right? Who Mm -hmm. came down from heaven and became incarnate, right? Mm -hmm. And suffered and was buried and rose again. That who is the eternal, pre-eternal uh, second person of the Holy Trinity, uh, God the Son, right? Mm-hmm. His mm-hmm. hypostasis then is divine. Yeah. He does not assume or take over or join himself to a human hypostasis. Mm-hmm. That is the error of Nestorianism. Mm-hmm. And I like to point out, if he had taken such uh, a human hypothesis to himself by extension, by the same reasoning, that means he would have automatically saved every hypothesis. Everyone. But he, but since he doesn't have a human hypothesis, that's an affirmation to us uh, okay. with the gift of free will that he's given us so that our response will be uh, a truly loving and truly freely chosen response, right? If not, mm-hmm. If not, if we're forced to finally, in the end, accept his love, is that really, uh, is that really love? Right. I don't think so. I would not yeah. define love that way personally, yeah. but. Right, right. Okay. So, yes, of course, it's his desire that we all be saved. Uh, let's go to the next one. Yeah. First uh, Corinthians 15, 22 to 28. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christ making all alive. Well, this is an affirmation that. Uh, we don't have uh, an annihilation of the uh, uh, of the human being. We it's bedrock understanding for us. The soul is immortal. Mm-hmm. All will be made alive. Yeah, uh, we'll all be resurrected with our bodies restored to us. Right. Yeah. Um, at the uh, second coming of Christ, we will be judged with our bodies, mm-hmm. with which we did our sinning. <laughs> and our good works right that's right that's right right and you know when we uh come up to the pearly gate so to speak we don't have saint her saint peter with a big eraser you know rubbing away all of our memories right where would be the the uh where would we be we wouldn't uh, in such a case we be, that's right. we would be in a, in in effect annihilated yeah but this is not whatsoever our understanding uh, so, yeah, and then uh, Romans five eighteen, mm-hmm. Christ's free gift comes to all men. Well, yes, it's a gift. It's not forced upon us. Yeah. When you give a gift, my goodness, what would what would it be like? How would you feel if the person goes like this? I don't want that gift, and you keep forcing, 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 and jamming it, you know, right under, under their arms or something. What kind of <laughs> response is that to God's free gift? Yeah. The, and and like we were saying earlier, let's just go to the the case of the devil. Can we ever, ever even imagine really he's going to open his arms and accept 
Christ's gift of salvation that mm -hmm. he has been desperately trying to steer people away from for eons? Where's, <laughs> where, where's any possible indication that he would even have a trace of remorse? Right, right. It, you know, it seems that the, the traditional view has a really good balance of... <laughs> Mm -hmm. because you brought up limited atonement a while ago and it seems and, and now correct me if i'm wrong but that those who now not those who hold to limited atonement are, are, are calvinist friends but it seems the same general error is being made whenever it comes to penal substitutionary atonement that the universalists hold that the calvinists hold to instead of saying from the universalist perspective though instead of saying no christ didn't only die for some there that that is efficacious all of that and it's only applied to some no no no. he does that for all therefore all will be saved is yes. that is that a yeah. fair understanding okay it really is yes it's very helpful i think to identify the exact same presupposition yeah. in calvinism with uh uh, only some being saved, the elect, right? Predestination, only some. Right. The same presupposition with the universalists that it must be God who does the final deciding, mm -hmm. right? And so I like to kind of use this, this language. It seems with the Calvinists and the universalists, we have the same uh, dy dynamic going of placing the mystery mm -hmm. of why everyone isn't saved into God's heart, right? Taking mm. it out of man's heart, taking out of the taking it out of the demon's heart, and sure. placing it in God's heart, and that's that's the fatal mistake. Yeah, the fatal mistake. Sin is a mystery, uh, but we have that capacity to sin. That's right. And if we didn't, if we didn't, we would not have the freedom that God himself has. Right. That's right. He, he created freely. And yes, it is an awesome thing. It's a and, and I think it staggers uh, the universalists. They just can't bear to think mm -hmm. that created beings created by the fully loving God would have that capacity to reject God's love forever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It is hard. And, and and some people will say, well, God's will can never be thwarted. Mm. But I think when we when we think about it, every single time we sin, God's will we is are thwarting God's will. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 No, I, I I agree. I agree. And and with that being said, I think you're absolutely right that and and what I said a while ago, this is a good middle of the road. I'm real. I don't like going to one extreme to another. Stay yeah, in the middle of the road, people will be fine. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And, orthodoxy. And that, that's right, exactly. It? That's called Eastern Orthodoxy, and, the and there's parishes. Road. That's the right. Road. The, the narrow to road. The right to the left. <laughs> that's <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I love. Can I just say real quick, Dr. Ford, sure. I love your passion. I see why you've been a teacher for 35 years. Oh. Like, I could listen to you all day. I love your passion. Oh, thank, um, you. thank you. Absolutely, sir. absolutely. Oh. This is great. This is probably my favorite interview. Sorry to everybody else, but this is oh, probably my favorite oh interview. Oh, gosh. Thank you. All right. Um, so with that being said, oh, man, I could talk to you all day about this, but I know I, I want to be respectful of your time as well. Um, I've got two hours. I can go till two if you want. All right. All right. Let, let's we'll we'll see how these keep going. Let's and I'm sure it'll be a, I'm sure it'll be quick getting there. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so we've talked about scripture. We've talked about definition so far. What exactly is universalism? Uh, Why do we reject universalism? Um, let me let me ask you this, Doctor Ford. Scripture wise, now yes, this seems like a a no brainer to me. But hey, there's some people out there that that I hopefully will benefit from this section right here. But yeah. what what's what are some scriptures that are common commonly referenced within our tradition that refute the idea of universal salvation? Yes. Um, I've already mentioned the two passages by St. Paul. Yes. Uh, today is the day of salvation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think the most important passage is probably, well, I mean, the Lord himself, right? Yeah. He speaks the most in all the scriptural 
in all the writings of the New Testament, uh, it's Jesus Christ himself, our Lord, who is talking most about uh, uh, the reality of, uh, in the next life of those who have not repented in this life, the reality of the weeping and gnashing of teeth, yeah. um, the reality of, of hell. Now, let, let's, let's, uh, let's talk a bit about our understanding of hell. Um, mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a place, you know. Um, the fathers talk about uh, hell as, as if we're living without God. I mean, isn't it really, isn't it really hell? Mm -hmm. And um, Saint John Chrysostom will say, "What's the greatest, most grievous aspect of dying outside the faith, outside uh, in, in rejecting uh, the love of the Lord?" And uh, he says, "It's not." It's not the torments, the physical torments that may be there uh, in the in 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 the uh, uh, in the realm of what we call hell or Hades, yeah. uh, but the greatest grief will be living without the Lord, mm -hmm. and and we also understand that His love uh, actually extends even into the depths of hell, yeah. but. The for the for those who are rejecting that love, it's scalding, right? For those who respond to the love, it's uh, it's joy. So, um, yeah, you know, David says, "Where can I run?" <laughs> when he's feeling uh, in in such a bad spiritual state, he wants to run from God. He That's says, right. "I can't even run to hell, right? I know right. you will be there." Yeah, right. So that's part of it uh, somehow. Okay. Now, and the, the, the passage that comes to my mind, I've brought this up a few times on justification episodes specifically. Yeah. And that, and, and I'd love to get your opinion on this, but Matthew 25 really seems to yes. kind of in itself. And like you said, this is Jesus speaking. And so yes. I'm not a red word right. only kind of guy. All of the scripture is, is, is Theonistos breathed out by God. But, yes. But yeah, there is something about Jesus speaking that that really that I love personally. Yeah, and yet sure. Jesus in Jesus in Matthew 25 talks about those on his right, those on his left, and that those on his left will and and I forget the verb that's off the top I'm, of my head. Yeah. Um but they I'm will looking be looking at it right now. Okay, you are. Yeah, you are. Here, okay. Here it is. Here yeah, it go is. ahead. Yes. Matthew 25:41. Mm -hmm. Then shall the Lord say unto those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, That's it. into everlasting fire. There's the everlasting. Prepared mm -hmm. what? For the devil and his oh, angels. angels. Yep. So, I mean, that's utterly clear with, with the uh, dark forces. Yeah, right. It's utterly clear. And, mm -hmm. and um, it also indicates it's not made. He did not fashion uh the realm of torment for those who would reject his love because mm -hmm. he never wanted anyone to reject his love right right now is those are the that's the consequence that's yeah. right now yeah. you said depart that's that's interesting because automatically now my mind goes to matthew 7 uh, 21 i think it is where jesus is talking to people Look at all the good works that I've done. Look at all, but depart from me. I never knew you. The way I've heard that Greek word explained is get away from me. Yeah. I never knew you. Is that mm -hmm. the same word yeah. you know off the top of your head? Is it? Most likely it would be. I don't know for sure, but. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. That, so that's it. Yeah. That's no, I was great, just going to say that's. Connection. Good. Yeah, connection. go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please. That's, that's good. That's that's interesting to me because I've never thought about those two passages like that before. But as soon as you said the part, Matthew seven for some reason came into my mind. So go. I would love to do a Greek study on that just to see <laughs> how close that is. Um, but okay, and so we've got Matthew twenty five, Matthew seven. Is there any other passages, Doctor Ford, that you want to touch on real quick? Uh, in terms of um, uh, the reality of. Uh, Yes, yes, mm -hmm. I do. Okay. The reality of uh, damnation, eternal condemnation. Let's go to Second Thessalonians 2. Okay. Uh, starting with verse 3. Okay. Let no one deceive you by any means. Wow, talking about the devil's efforts to deceive, right? Uh-huh. 
for that day, capital D, Judgment Day, will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Wow. It sure doesn't sound like one day he won't be a son of perdition. Right. Who opposes and exalts himself, talking about pride, above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. Mm -hmm. Do you not remember that that uh, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining. He may be revealed in his own time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, actually, I went to the uh, to a different passage. Let's start. <laughs> Can we go back to chapter one? Although Let's do it. That, that was that was interesting too, right? Chapter one, verse three. Yeah. Um, in Second Thessalonians. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you abounds towards each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. You're, a lot of effort is required, right, to be in the kingdom. It's just so not automatic. Since it is a righteous thing with God, see, to repay with tribulation those who trouble you right. and to give you who are troubled, to give you rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Here's the second coming, right? In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these, verse 9, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, right? Yeah. Depart from me and yeah. from the glory of his power when he comes in that day. Mm -hmm. So what could be more clear from the scriptures? It takes contortions, mental gymnastics, you know, mm -hmm. to try to uh, get around these these verses. And and really, it, it's a uh, it's a sign of every single heresy. Uh, there are certain scriptures that they emphasize. Right. Yes. If there weren't any scriptures in that direction or that right. could, that might could be taken in that direction, then there'd be nothing to stand on. Right. It would have right. no it would have no uh, credibility whatsoever. So there's right. always some, mm -hmm. um, but of course, uh, the gospel includes everything in the Bible, not just some passages. Everything has to be interpreted in light of everything else. That's right. Um, yeah. So, uh, but what could be more clear than that? I, I, I think you're absolutely right. This is exactly why I wanted to touch on some passages that they like to use and then some <laughs> of the passages that we like to use as well. Um, everybody's got their proof text. Every every That's camp, right. every That's model right. has their proof text, which is exactly right. what you were saying. Um, now, could uh, could we ad address one more of their proof texts? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that, yeah, this would be Philippians two nine to eleven. Oh, okay, I think this is I think this is one of their main ones, and I'll read it. Yeah. Therefore, God also has highly exalted the Son, and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, maybe even demons that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. Mm -hmm. Now, in my notes, I address that passage, which at first sight, sure, looks like everyone is uh, acknowledging Christ. Surely this must mean they're all, they're all being redeemed, right? And uh, not, and, and that that none of them will be suffering eternal torment. Mm -hmm. But what's the context? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every single verse has to be cons considered in the context. It's the context of Christ's final victory over sin, death, and the devil. And every living being, every living being, sorry, will be made to acknowledge him as victor, whether they want to or not. That's right. In this case. This passage does not imply 
that every soul who has ever lived will be willingly and lovingly bowing their knee, right. you know, acknowledging Jesus as Lord and God and their personal Savior. That's right. And and yeah. I think comparing this back to Matthew 7 shows just that. Those people were calling Jesus Lord. Lord, didn't we do these things in your name? Didn't we do mighty miracles in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Lord, why aren't you saving me? And he says, what? Depart from me. I never knew you. That doesn't sound like, and in my humble opinion, that does not sound like Jesus is accepting them and saying, welcome to the kingdom, my good and faithful servant. Right. It's very different. Right. Yeah. Yes. All righty. Um, with that being said, I want to turn just to one more passage for, for our position, and it's one I thought of while you were describing this, actually. Oh. So I want to get your thoughts on Mark 3 specifically, uh, verse 28. But let me start. I've got it up. Uh, let me start in 23 and then I will, I will end in 30. Okay. Let me turn to it then. Mark. Uh, yeah. Mark yeah. chapter three, verse 23. Okay. Yeah. Mark three, mm -hmm. verse 23. Okay. Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has come to an end. No one can enter into the house of a strong man in order to plunder it unless he first binds the strong man. Then he will plunder his house. Amen. All human sins will be forgiven and all the blasphemies ever uttered. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal condemnation. He yes. spoke these words because they had said he has an unclean spirit. Now, in the, uh, so first of all, I'm reading out of the Eastern Orthodox uh, Bible, the New Testament. Yeah, I've got that too. Okay, that's yeah, a good one. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah, that yeah. translation. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, and I also love the 1904, uh, the Greek text uh, that this translation is based off of. Um, which is fa fantastic. Um, but 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 anyway, not to get off into uh, so everyone that knows that watches this channel regu regularly knows that I'm a Greek nerd, and uh, and I'm getting ready to Great. take a, a 16 week class on the Book of Romans. Um, so that's going to be fun. And and Great. those who those who watch this channel know I'll have a lot of things to say about Calvinism after I'm done with this one. But <laughs> but we'll see. Um, but 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 to the point. Amen. All all human sins, back in verse 28, all human sins will be forgiven and all blasphemies ever are uttered. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal condemnation. This seems more to me than just a warning. In mm -hmm. other passages, in, in other gospel passages, it seems like there are those, specifically Pharisees and people Jesus is talking to here, who is doing that very thing. And so oh, yeah, to me, right. yeah, that just seems like, well, what about these people? I mean, it seems like from a universalist perspective, this would be one of the toughest passages to answer because oh, yeah. they would, it, 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 I, I want to get your opinion, but it just seems like real quick that they would have to say Jesus didn't really mean what he said here. Yeah, it's so clear. It's so clear. What what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, oh yeah, um, it, it it's it's another indication that eternal condemnation is a real thing, right? Right. It's a real possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I appreciate that, Doctor Ford. Um, let's turn to then salvation and eschatology, though. Like we haven't huh. been talking about that already. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and and this is under uh, uh section four uh, yes. of my notes here that I sent to you. So, yep. so just the first one, just off the top. So, and, and I think we've, we've touched on this, but, but as a brief summarization for, for maybe people who might've missed this part, but what exactly is the Eastern Orthodox church? How do we understand the concepts of hell and eternal punishment is the traditional view, what is commonly referred to today in, in Protestant circles anyway, for those who don't know, I come from a Protestant background. So this is where I'm pulling this, this phrase out of, but is what's described as eternal conscious torment 
or is our eschatology a bit more nuanced than that? No, we have, um, we, we, I think we mentioned this a little bit before, yeah. uh, the immortality of the soul, right? Mm -hmm. The consciousness uh, will continue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe it's the Jehovah's Witnesses who uh, talk about the annihilation of the damned mm -hmm. uh, as a way to um, uh, avoid the uh, possibility or the, the contemplation of sentient beings uh, suffering forever consciously that would be one way to to get around that which is hard of course it is hard right. for us uh uh to to think of any sentient being i mean if we have compassion even for the demons uh, uh to be living in such torment uh of course we shudder we grieve but mm -hmm. we can't let our feelings right uh somehow uh dictate our theology right especially to the point of overturning what the church has been teaching consistently for two thousand years right if anything this should dictate our evangelism not our theology yes. this should motivate us to get out there and tell people about jesus i mean absolutely I'm not saying everybody should stand on a street corner, but what I am saying yeah. is we can evangelize n not in that way, but if that's your thing, hey, go for it. Yeah. But it's not right. mine. Yeah. But I talk to my coworkers about Christ just in just in conversation, just yes, randomly. We have a chance, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. that's evangelism, you know, mm -hmm. to me is that yes. you're you're spreading the gospel, you're sharing the good news about Christ. And you're telling people what he did, what he accomplished. It's a history lesson, really. But it's <laughs> yeah, so much it more than that whenever yeah. it impacts you in the way that it's impacted people like us. Yeah. And so, so let more. yeah, let our theology don't, like you just said, I, I love it. Don't try to overturn the theology. Let the theology be a motivator to go evangelize people. Beautiful. Beautiful. Perfect. All yeah. right. So that's actually a really great segue into into my next question under this. So it's no secret, people talk about it all the time, that popular clergy like Metropolitan Callisto Square, may his memory be eternal, Yes. for example, held to the idea that, quote unquote, hoping for all to be saved is not in direct opposition to orthodox dogma or doctrine. Do you believe there's a place for that, for the hope that all will mm -hmm. eventually be saved within... Yes. Orthodox eschatology. Oh, oh yes, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Okay. It's the hope. My goodness, wouldn't it be glorious if hell were empty? <laughs> you know, if even the devil and his and his demons repented. My goodness, they were angels. Yeah, <laughs> they still, the you know the core of their being is still good, mm -hmm. uh, because they were made by the good God. Mm -hmm who loves mankind and who loves angels. And uh, I think it's it's just, it's extra infuriating for the demons, but it's their own choice that mm -hmm. they can't just annihilate, annihilate themselves. Right. They are not 100% unequivocally evil. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? It's mm -hmm. good to, I think it's helpful to remember that mm -hmm. uh, if we, when we're involved in spiritual warfare, um, the devil can never have the last word because he's not utterly evil. <laughs> there, there is still a core in there that right. is good, even right. with him. Yeah. Is that because Ooh. he is a creation of God? Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. He chose to fall. He chose to rebel. Right. Yeah. That's that's so interesting. Go going back to what we were saying earlier about we don't see any kind of repentance in him. Yeah or any like that, but, but there's still that idea that it's possible. Um, that because, and, and, and maybe so probably not likely whatever, but there is that core. That's something and I'm glad you brought that up Dr. Ford. Cause I wasn't thinking that whenever mm -hmm. I said what I said earlier, mm -hmm. but you're right because he is a creation of God going back to what John of Damascus and or, uh, all the other fathers, God, what is God's creation that is even described in the Bible? It's very good. Absolutely. Genesis 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, that's interesting. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, 
this, so just a follow up to that then, because I've really been wrestling with this and, and, and I don't have this one wrote down. I, I should have probably, but, but so just off the top of my head, whenever, so talking about hopeful universalism mm -hmm. is could, let me put it like this. Could that be taken in a way that contradicts what we know to be true and what what i mean by that is we know what the church says about these things to say yes i know that i believe that there are people that are going to go to hell or or, or the lake of fire or however you want to define that yeah. but i still hope that they won't is there like a seeming contradiction there or or not so much no i i hear what you're saying uh <laughs> so utterly extremely unlikely okay. for the devil to ever repent yeah um and and of course to take a few examples judas i mean actually in that case it says he did, the word is used he did repent mm -hmm. uh but then hung himself right uh, with arius he, you know he dies a miserable death apparently mm -hmm. never did repent um but always don't we have to say god has the last word he just has the last word. We can hope. It's it's natural, I think, in our humanness, right? Our 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 natural sense of sympathy, yeah, uh, for anyone who's suffering. Yeah, we can yeah. hope. But, uh, but uh, please, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say real quick, and I don't want to interrupt the the, no, no. the flow of your thought. Yeah, I was yeah. just gonna say if there's any, do I'll put it like this: if there's any doctrine that I'm okay being wrong with. <laughs> it's the eternal conscious torment one. Like oh, that's, I'm cool with that. I'll be yeah, all right. I was wrong. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, <laughs> no yeah. sweat off my back. Yeah, but no. if I'm wrong about determinism, that's scary. But yeah. if I'm wrong about e e ECT, okay, I I'm cool with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we can we can hope for their repentance. But remember, as as we said yeah. earlier, the church never, never uh, encourages us to pray for the demons. Right. So. I mean, and, 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 and there is pastoral wisdom in that too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because of the devil being so devious, so slippery, so vicious, we, the church counsels us not even to associate with him uh, to the extent of praying for him and, and the demons, right? Yeah. Just stay away. That's stay right. Away. We are not ignorant of the wiles of the devil, St. Peter says, and uh, yeah, stay away. Right on. All right. Let's, I, I would love to get practical with you for a second. Being, being a professor at St. Ticons, I'm sure you have a lot of students and in 35 years, I'm sure you've had a lot of students that come yeah. up to you with practical concerns. And so Dr. Ford, being a professor in general, like I said, I'm sure you come across different ideologies that aren't always on par with traditional Eastern Orthodox thought. How do you personally counsel those around you, whether they be students or friends or family who are drawn to the idea of universal salvation? And also, mm -hmm. what advice would you give to Orthodox laity or clergy that engage others, whether in the public or private sphere, regarding this conversation specifically or eschatological conversations in general? Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing that comes to mind is is simply humility okay humbly accepting the consistent teaching of the church through the centuries god's god's true church okay um you know we're always counseled uh if we come to the lord on our knees we need to come to his church mm -hmm. on our knees we have to be willing to set aside all of our preconceived notions, whatever they might be about anything, right? And yeah. humbly uh, ask for instruction and, and, and to be open to receive it humbly, realizing the church knows way more mm -hmm. than we do, you know? Right. Way, way more. The, the, Lord, the Lord is, it's a reflection of the Lord being uncreated. We're created. Yeah. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, right? That's and right. The church, is, the church is his body. It's 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 the realm of truth. So uh, it's the realm of the spirit of truth. Yeah. So we 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 yield willingly, humbly uh, to the greater, far greater wisdom of the church. 
yeah mm. with humility it takes humility yeah yeah i i like that and and i know so i know for a fact that there are going to be some listening to this that say see they're talking about the traditions of men they are they're that's what they're banking on no different than what I am. I, I believe, you know, I have reasoning, which is what we said earlier about not leaning too much on your understanding. I think there's a Bible verse that talks about that somewhere. Yes, uh, there is. <laughs> yeah, but but no, it's not just the traditions of men. It's the traditions of men inspired by the Spirit. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the way I've seen this. And, and coming yeah. from a Protestant background, that is the thing that's really stood out to me the most and and helped me in my conversion to mm. orthodoxy is that i look and i see how the church and specifically you mentioned a while ago acts 15 saint james says it seems good to the holy spirit and to us well is the <laughs> holy spirit still working in his church or not if he is where's that church because amen. i want to be a part of it amen so yeah. that it, it's not just the traditions of men. We're, we're not banking on others' understanding. We're banking on others' understanding who are indwelt, inspired, and led by the Spirit of our Holy God. Oh, man. Beautifully stated. Thank you. That's it. That's, That's it. it. <laughs> and it's confirmed. You know, it's confirmed through the saints. Yeah. Uh, right. They, who of all, you know, human beings have, have uh, lived closest to the Lord closest to the Holy Spirit of truth, the, the saints. Mm -hmm. And and they are agonizing in prayer. Um, could I read a passage along that Absolutely. line? Absolutely. Please. Okay. Please. Um, if universalism really were true mm -hmm. and everyone gets saved in the end, why would there be saints praying like this? Now, I'm, I'm reading from uh, our command, right, Zach? Zacharias Zacharu prayer as okay. infinite in prayer as infinite creation. You know, Father Zacharias, we love him so much. He is uh, at the Essex Monastery in England. Okay, he was founded by Father now Saint Sophroni. Oh wow! Yeah, so he's drawing on his own experience in prayer. Sure. Um, yes. However, page one fifteen. This is a magnificent book. Uh, prayer as infinite creation. However. When God's grace penetrates even into the pores of one's body, it frees him from manifold forms of enslavement, from fear, from uncertainty, from anxiety. The holy life of the Holy Spirit now accumulates within him. Man becomes established as the true image of God, desiring only good for all that all should be saved. This is our desire. This is our hope, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. The will of the Lord, here's 1 Timothy 2, 4. Yeah. The will of the Lord, comma, quote, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, comma, becomes the sole law of this man's experience, his existence. He ceases to have enemies because he sees in all mankind the same nature, groaning under the dominion of death. Upon all, he bids the abundance of life his struggle, as St. Sophroni says, is against the common enemy of all people, death. The one praying fights for resurrection, his, per his personal resurrection and that of every other fellow human being. Wow. Yes, the saints pray for the salvation of all. Moreover, they pray that every person uh, effortlessly as a free gift may come to know the grace of the Holy Spirit, yeah. which they themselves have experienced through indescribable toil and sacrifice. He says it's like a skewer piercing his heart. Thus did the saints pray, feeling out of the feeling they, they for those when they see people suffering, enduring poverty, deprivation, illness, and futility, and straying on the path to perdition. Mm. Praying. You know, you talked about the incentive to spread the gospel. Mm. Here's the incentive to pray. Amen. for all human beings uh, to be saved. Mm -hmm. But it's no guarantee that everyone will. Some of them won't. That's right. that's the most likely. I, I mean, that's the reality, right? Sure. Yeah. So he talks about it. Uh, to pray for people like this is to shed blood for them. Yeah. 
but we must pray. That's okay. right. Yeah. That's right. That's beautiful. And and that, so I'm going to get personal just for a quick second. I've, I, I think I've talked about this before. I don't know if I have or not, but I'm 34 now. And whenever I was six years old, my brother died oh, um, out, outside the church, um, outside Protestantism, outside Orthodoxy, outside Roman Catholicism. My brother um, was, for lack of better words, not a very nice man. Um, and now he's 30 years older than me. Um, that's a fun conversation, yeah. <laughs> wow. but let's just say, let's just say at 50 years old, my dad wanted another kid and my mom wanted to get married. And so that's how that happened. <laughs> but with that being said, um, so obviously we're not traditional Christians at, at this point. Um, but, but, and what, what you just read though, Dr. Ford, that is the reason why I have and continue to pray for my brother's salvation. Beautiful. Um, because God is merciful. God does respond to prayers. Now, here's the thing, though, that separates me from other people uh, in the sense that I'm not, and I'm not saying anyone is doing this, but at the same time, if, if that prayer is not answered in the affirmative, then I know that there is a reason that God, number one, doesn't have to justify to me. We might talk about it, how that works, but the yeah. point is, is I'm willing to submit to God at that point oh, with me, with my brother, with whoever else. This is his creation. And Beautiful. so I'm not going to let the death of one dictate my theology in that sense. Right. And so I, I know people have done that and, and I don't get me wrong. So, so the reason I bring that up is because I know where they're coming from. I get it. I, wow. God forbid I lose my daughters in, or anyway, but again, at the same time, God's real and God is good. Yeah. And so that's what keeps me going forward, no yeah. matter the circumstances. So beautiful. Yes. Yes, God's goodness is greater than we could ever imagine. His mm -hmm. love is greater than we can ever imagine or ever figure out. Yeah. Uh, we trust That's his right. goodness and his love. That's even right. If we, even if it somehow it's hard to understand. Sure. All yeah. right. That's it. That's it. Amen. All right, uh, Dr. Ford. So I am down to my last three, well, technically four questions. Um so contemporary views, and I'm just curious if you want to get into this more, we can, but I'll just mention the letter and then we can, and, and ask my question and then we can go from there if you'd like to. Um, so you've personally written a letter, a public letter, I should say, to Father Aiden Kimmel, lovingly yeah. encouraging him to rethink his position concerning universalism. My question more so though, do you know if there are any other contemporary Eastern Orthodox scholars and or clergy who are engaging with the topic of Christian universalism? Mm -hmm. And if not, do you believe that this is a topic more Orthodox Christians should be discussing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, of course, um, we did see David, Father, uh, sorry, Dr. David Bradshaw. Yes. Uh, on that video that you mentioned. Yes. Um, it probably would be nice to have more Orthodox scholars ad addressing the concern as long as it is tempting anyone. Oh, my goodness, we have a pastoral responsibility to try to help them see that uh, that it is uh, erroneous, mm -hmm. that thinking is erroneous. It's a pastoral responsibility. Um, sometimes people wonder, uh, maybe this was another, uh, yeah, whether the fathers... Um, specifically wrote against it, against universalism. Mm -hmm. And um, as far as I can tell, there isn't very much in the fathers that's directly addressing that erroneous thinking, probably because it's just so uh, uh, against, counter to the words of Christ, to the yeah. words of St. Paul, to the tradition of the church, to our prayer life. Right. Um, you know, that, that in the whole sweep of, 20 centuries, it has not really been uh, too much of a threat. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that it's the, the threat is reviving in our own time, which I think 
is very understandable because it does reflect so much the uh, zeitgeist of our own of our own time. You know, wanting things to be easy, wanting everything to work out as we want it to work out, trusting our own uh, patterns of thinking, our own thinking, uh, thoughts and feelings, uh, as if somehow they can uh, be a higher authority than the church. But could I share from St. John Chrysostom? Please. uh, He does address it directly. And these two passages are in my book, Sing to Your Soul, Volume 1. The, the, narr- the uh, narrative of salvation history. Uh, this uh, it's a three volume set, and okay. each volume is totally comprised of especially wonderful passages, all by Saint John Chrysostom. Okay, and you know he he really is the lodestone. Um, not only is he one of the three uh, hier- uh, holy hierarchs celebrated with their own day, right on January thirtieth, yeah, but Every icon I've ever seen of the three holy hierarchs, St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil the Great, and St. Gregory the Theologian, Mm -hmm. who's in the middle? Mm. It's always St. John Chrysostom. St. John Chrysostom. He's the lodestone, so let's listen to him. There are many people, page 139, there are many people who have good hope about the next life, not from abstaining from sins, but from thinking that hell is not so terrible as it's said to be, that it's milder than it's threatened to be, and that it's temporary. Mm. Whoa, not eternal. Does he have some modern thinkers specifically in mind? Yep. Woo, listen to this. Comma, semicolon. And they philosophize much about this. Mm -hmm. but I could draw, he goes on, but I could show from many places in the scriptures, which we've been doing, right? That's right. And conclude from the very words about hell written there, that it is not only not milder, but much more terrible than is threatened, than is threatened. Mm -hmm. I won't discourse further about these things. Now, the fear generated by the mere words of the scripture is sufficient without our having to expound upon them. Next paragraph. But, excuse me, but Mm -hmm. that hell is not temporary. Here Paul now saying concerning those who do not know God and who do not believe the gospel, that they will endure punishment, even eternal destruction. His appearing to some will be light, to others will be torment. And here's the next passage along the same line in a different place. Yeah. Page 141. Others confess the Lord, but deny the teaching about judgment and punishment, thereby buying a brief time of joy or relief, maybe, at the cost of heavy punishment, Mm -hmm. desiring to console themselves by not remembering hell, or, mm. you know, pretending or convincing themselves it doesn't exist. Sure. They forget by this fearlessness that they are actually casting themselves into the depths of destruction. Okay. He goes on. Yeah. Wherefore, I implore you to remember hell, to converse about it. This is his pastoral advice. Wow. And re- you know, it, it, I'm instantly reminded of St. St. Silouan, keep your mind in hell and despair not, right? That's right. There's something very sobering about remembering the reality of hell uh, to uh, inspire us even more, right? That's right. To stay in the direction of the good and not to stray towards evil in any way, right? So, yes, in this way, here's the result. Remember hell, remember the possibility of that torment. This will keep your soul in good condition. Oh, wow. For there is much benefit in such discussions. Yeah. It's not idly that God has threatened us with hell, uh-huh. that he has already made it so evident to us. Rather, it's so that he may make us better through our fear of it. And one more paragraph in this uh, passage. Yeah. Wherefore the devil, we've talked about him, his delusions, right? 
Wherefore the devil makes it his business to do everything he can in his wish to abolish our memory of hell. So don't cast away that memory and don't ask, why should I distress myself now about that future time? Distress yourself about that time? You will really be distressed when you're suffering in hell. Hence, this is the time to be distressed so you won't suffer then. Amen. <laughs> well, 1600 years ahead of time. What? Yeah. Concerning our modern universalists. Woo. That, I don't have a follow up to that. that <laughs> wow. First of all, well, I'll say this. First of all, I'm going to, so I've got it copied the link to the to your book i'm going to put it in the description if anybody wants to buy it go for it it's on amazon um go pick it up i have to get a copy of it myself and so but that's i like i said i don't have anything after that um dr ford do you want to comment on what you just read because that is exactly what i was trying to say earlier let the reality of hell push us in theosis in becoming like christ and gathering, as Jude says, snatching some from the fire with mercy. Uh huh. Yeah. And, and of course, in, in, you know, uh, probably avoiding hell is not the highest <laughs> That's right. motivation. Right? That's right. Granted that. It, 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 and St. John would probably say, you know, of course it's much better to love the Lord just because he's so lovable. I mean, you know, right. he's just so wonderful but yeah. if this is what it takes for someone to be uh, moving towards the lord if that's what it takes fear of hell fear of eternal torment then so be it yeah. and and this i think he would say this is god's in a way kind of last ditch effort you know mm. to draw people to himself mm -hmm. and 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 even if it is in this yeah uh, in, in a motive that's that's uh maybe less than uh, than wonderful if that's what it takes yeah god is not you know he, he he's not uh uh reluctant to right. draw people even even by that means that's right that's yeah. right and and anything yeah. i mean maybe that fear of hell will lead to a greater love for the lord uh -huh. Absolutely. to do those things for yeah. him out of love and not yeah. up, because that's that yeah. is by far the message that we are not advocating for is to please God out of fear. No, we obey and command in a joyous way. Amen. Because of love. Ah, oh, wow, beautiful. Beautiful. I got to get that book. I will get that book very very <laughs> soon. So thank you for that Dr. Ford. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. So I'm on so the last things now. Okay. This is so this actually I think that was a really good segue and maybe and maybe you've already answered this question in what you've just read but i'll read it anyway in case you want to summarize or add to what you just said so we we know that there are some universalists that will say things like well god is love and has infinite mercy so he wouldn't subject any of his creation to eternal suffering and and, and this is a direct quote i pulled quote eternal punishment for finite sins committed in a human lifetime is incompatible incompatible with a just and fair god in quote how should we respond to these things yeah it's um it's human it's human reasoning right yeah. human understanding it's uh painting god in our own image really yeah you know who are we to say what's just and fair when he is infinitely beyond those categories. Um, yeah, it, we have to, as we've said, we can't rely on our own understanding, our own feelings. It's, uh, it is mystery. Uh, ultimately, or everything really is, is mystery. Um, one, one little example uh, might be helpful. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's certainly been a, a, a feature of human existence that that when children have gone off the rails to such an extent uh their parents um dispossess them mm. you know mm -hmm. disinherit mm -hmm. them sure um 
it's uh, maybe in some small way um, that helps us understand if even in this life we love our children so intensely and yet there can come a point right when they do things that are so wrong right. we have to like like jesus said depart from me yeah you know mm -hmm. so in god's in in god's heart yes it must be grievous it must be grievous but he doesn't force he just right. doesn't force that would not be honoring the free will that he has given us himself yeah paul says saint paul says to not grieve the holy spirit which it uh, seems like in a very real way that would be possible maybe not in the way that we are grieved per se but but in some sense that that would apply to god as well so i definitely hear what you're saying and that's a practical thing as well you know we live our life in submission to god not in opposition to him and yeah like it, the, the whenever you were speaking the prodigal son came to mind the father didn't oh. force his son to stay there you go he let him go and what happened he realized the earth was way and came back yes beautiful. what a beautiful picture yes i'm glad you've mentioned that that says a lot mm -hmm. the father let him go and they even say, you know, by that younger son asking for his inheritance, mm -hmm. that was in effect wishing his dad were dead. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a blow. Yeah. yeah. What a blow. To me, you're, you, you've died. Give me the inheritance that I expect when you die. I right. want it early. You're dead to me in, a, mm. in essence, right? Wasn't he saying that? And yeah. yet the father keeps uh, loving him, yearning for him to come back but he doesn't search him out. He right. waits for him to return. Right. Then when he sees him coming, wow, then he runs with great joy and forgives Amen. him, overflowing with forgiveness. Wow, that's our Amen. God. All the angels rejoice when one sinner <laughs> repents. Oh, oh, man. I see why. <laughs> oh, All right, the last, so the last quote, and I think, when, let me put it like this. Whenever I first heard this quote, I was shocked, honestly. Mm -hmm. The more I think about this now, especially after talking with you, I don't know how to feel about it, to be perfectly honest. I'm not in disgust about it anymore, but I'm not sure quite how to feel about it. So I'm curious about what you think about this. So again, this is a direct quote. I won't mention names because, um, again, we're not here to, to bash on anybody or anything like that. But But the quote is, if a preacher is not declaring the gospel in such a way that it does not raise the question, does that mean all will be saved? He's not preaching the gospel, end quote. What are your thoughts about that quote? Because I, yeah. let, let me just say this real quick. Mm. When I first heard that, I was shocked because... That almost seems like, especially if you take the orthodox traditional view, that's not the gospel that they preach to make people question, well, does that mean all will be saved? No. Um, but like I said, now I don't know how to feel about it. Um, mm. So what are your thoughts on that quote? And uh, yeah, take it away, Dr. Ford. Mm. Well, uh, perhaps this is uh, um, coming from from a universalist position where they very would... much so okay yeah very much so <laughs> okay yeah um uh, i suppose they would be saying uh the, the the preaching that they probably love the most is the preaching that is so emphatic about god's love right right um that um it would be coming uh hard for us to believe that with such love that you've been emphasizing in your preaching, right? Uh, uh, th that question might arise. Well, you've made him sound so loving. Surely in that love, he would not allow anyone uh, for any reason to uh -huh. languish in eternal torment. Mm -hmm. um, so I, again, I, I think it's it's just human feelings, mm -hmm. um, which which are fine as far as they go but they just they're not the last line they're yeah. not the, the bottom one you know yeah we have to trust the church 
Yeah, absolutely. We have to trust the church. Yeah. And, um, of course, uh, the gospel as we know it, as the church knows it, uh, includes the warning, right? Uh -huh. That uh, there are eternal consequences if we reject God. Yes. That, that has to be part of our preaching, at least at least now and then, I, I think you know, we would we would want to say, right? We, right. It, it, it's, it's, you know, uh, uh, it wouldn't be fair, right? There, uh, if we didn't warn people of the eternal consequences of rejecting God's love. That's, that's what I thought. And if you preach the gospel in such a way that people would question will all be saved, then it doesn't sound like you are including the retributive. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that God's justice is reconciliatory first and foremost. Redemption yes. is God's primary prerogative, I believe. Yes, his will. But, yes. His will for all to be saved. But that doesn't mean there's not a retributive aspect to this. Yes. And if the Bible teaches that, then for someone to preach a half gospel or a three quarter gospel or a seven eighths gospel <laughs> yeah. or a fifteen se or millimeters, what well, I, yeah, yeah. I don't know, I don't know metric, but but I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm USA standard guy. <laughs> but it's not the gospel then. Right. You're missing portions you of it. Yes, you are. And that's not the gospel. And right. so the gospel right. is good news. Yes, for those who accept it. Amen. Amen. Okay. Yep. All right. Those are all my questions. The last thing I do have, Dr. Ford, is there anything else that we didn't cover that you feel is absolutely necessary at this point? I know we talked. It, it, so, so just kind of winding down and wrapping up then. Mm -hmm. It sounds like universalism stems from a, and I said, so I say good place, meaning good intentions with yeah. good intentions. Exactly. Exactly. And, but it's a lot of feeling driven and philosophy driven, which yeah. we're not saying that feelings and philosophy are bad and we shouldn't use them like other of the Christian world would say. Um, sure. yeah. But at the same time, I think what we both have kind of mentioned through this, that middle route. We don't want to emphasize our feelings and our philosophy or even our theology or whatever. If it goes against the church, yeah. we don't want to emphasize yeah. that to a point in which it contradicts the church. Yeah. But at the same time, we're not saying don't use your feelings to rationalize these things. Don't use philosophy. God has given us all these things to use. Yes. yes. But when they go in, the church is going this way and you're starting to go that way, come back to the church. That's exactly it. Yes. Okay. Um, I do have a, a couple of things to add if, if I can. Yeah. Oh, please. My, my thoughts here. Okay. Please. Yes. We must emphasize that universalism has devastating pastoral consequences. Perhaps not with everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, it simply offers too much of a temptation to be lackadaisical in our spiritual life while we abide on, on this earth. You know, if our salvation is guaranteed, then it's surely going to undermine uh, the intensity of our spiritual life. Maybe not for everyone. Maybe some people just love the Lord you know, and are uh, 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 so intense on drawing closer to him. That's all they need. Uh, and and uh, um, they don't, uh, they, they're not banking on their eternal salvation. In fact, it's really, it's, it's really part of the incentive to uh, draw, to be so intense in our spiritual life, to be want, mm -hmm. wanting to be so close to Christ through our ascetic effort uh, and prayer and, and so on, because yeah. of the reality of those eternal consequences. Yeah. Um, if we believe it's guaranteed that we will be saved eventually, if we don't, if we believe we don't really need to keep the Lord's commandments in this life because we can repent 
in the next life that we don't need to be living in a state of continuing repentance just wait till the next life my goodness it's um yeah why should i do all i know i'll if I, why should i do all these things mm-hmm. why should those saints be praying sweating blood for the salvation of every possible soul if it's guaranteed in the end mm-hmm. and to add one more thing it's exceedingly telling we've already mentioned this yes that our church never exhorts us to pray for the demons um there has never been a saint experiencing the repentance and salvation of a demon the church knows it's just too dangerous for us we who so easily underestimate the sheer power and enormity of wickedness to associate with the demons even to the extent of praying for them yes jesus has made it so clear how does he describe the evil one he comes only what to kill steal and destroy, destroy. right yeah. in in uh, in john 10 mm-hmm. yeah so the pastoral repercussions see uh the reasoning might you know uh uh convince us to some extent mm-hmm. um but it's uh there's so much more to uh the spiritual life than our thinking uh uh our, our speculating you know in certain in certain directions if those directions have negative pastoral consequences that should be a sure sign right, right. that uh, something's wrong with our thinking right right amen amen and and I, I i don't say amen to emphasize or encourage wrong thinking but you're right to because wrong thinking leads to bad patterns of behavior and yes. participation in christ this is where this ultimately flows and so we try to cut off of the head this is exactly why i had you on dr ford to talk about this and to get to the root of this problem and i think we just did it Mm. this impacts your practical life this impacts your walk with christ in the church and to the kingdom and this is why we or me i i won't speak for anybody else but me but I despise this teaching, to be perfectly honest with you, because of the practical yeah. realities that it can, not necessarily that it does, right. but can and has in the past yes. led to. Yeah. So with that yeah. being said, Dr. Ford, you've been, again, my oh. favorite interviewee. Oh. oh, Tyler, you're kind. <laughs> I, I know. I, I, I mean it. I love your passion. I, I can tell you have a true heart for not only the subjects that we talk about, but for the people that are impacted by these. And this is why I love this because, oh. because we don't get this every time. And so I, to be perfectly honest, I've fallen asleep oh my. <laughs> during an interview oh my. one time. Oh my. <laughs> I can't do that here. So, so Dr. Ford, you're more than welcome back anytime. I would oh. love to talk to you about a, a numerous things, but oh, I would love to have you back. Great. Great. Let's count on that. God All God. right. Um, <laughs> is there any, so I'm going to put your book in the description. If people want that, uh-huh. then they can go to Amazon and, and click it and find it real quick. Is there anything else that you would like to, to advertise? Where can people find you? Do you have academia, uh, St. Tecon Seminary? If you want to plug yeah. that, feel free. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. St. Tecon's uh, Orthodox Seminary. Um, has uh, my bio, my bio, and uh, also yes, let's mention this. Uh, there is uh, on Ancient Faith Ministries. Okay. There is a permanent uh, kind of slot for Saint Tecons. It's called the Spirit of Saint Tecons. Okay. Uh, there are many things on there. Just scroll down. But uh, uh, I have actually recorded Volume One. Sing to your soul. Here it is. Nice. Yeah. So uh, I have read it. Um, what yes. a great joy. Just so amazing. Uh, so humbling for me. Uh, we've done the first volume. We're, we're into the second volume. And my intention is to do uh, the entire series. And then also to do two other works you might want to talk about in the popular patristic series. Yes. From St. Vladimir's Press. The Letters to St. Olympia by St. John Chrysostom. Okay. 
that's in that series. And then also my, my latest uh, publication is nine sermons all by St. John Chrysostom at dramatic moments of his life. Okay. And that is in the popular patristic series as well. Awesome. Yeah. And they're going to be an audio book form. Yes. 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 I, so as, God I, 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 I'll be praying that that happens oh, good. because good. I am an audio book fanatic. And okay. so now good. that you've told me about yeah. that, I will yeah. definitely go and be listening to your book tonight. Um, I, at my, at, at my day job. So I work third shift uh -huh. and I'm a welder. And so all I, for eight hours, I can sit there and listen to audiobooks and weld along and just, nice. and, and I love it. I got no. one other guy that works with me that don't ask too many questions. And uh -huh. so usually I can zone in and be fine, uh, yeah. but, but I will definitely, uh, add that to the description as well. So if you want the audiobook, check the description. If you want the paperback or hardback, um, check the description. Uh, both will be there, but Dr. Ford, it has been such a blessing to have you on. Oh, I really appreciate you taking you. your time to thank do you, this. Tyler. My and time. if there's any, um, any, any last words, I know I'm always horrible at wrapping up conversations cause I want to keep talking, <laughs> but is there any closing words we we've talked about where people can find you? Um, is there yeah. any closing words that you have for, for our listeners? Well, let's just keep the faith, Amen. trusting the Lord, trusting his Holy church. Yeah. Amen. Drawing closer to our, our Lord Amen. day by day, moment by moment. Amen. Amen. With that being said, <laughs> I will end this. Uh, uh, I do have one quick announcement. So for those who don't know, um, we have Faith Unaltered memberships now. Um, paid memberships, they're super cheap. $2.99 a month will get you premier and exclusive access to content that we only release to our members. Um, I just did a, not a live stream, we couldn't do the live stream uh, on Saturday because I was in a place where I didn't have service, but I will be uploading a members only showing one of my hobbies that I like to do outside of interviewing people and welding. Um, one of my hobbies that I did Saturday, uh, with a buddy of mine, we'll be uploading that very, very soon. And then the mid tier is, uh, just $2 more. So five or $4 and 99 cents a month. Uh, you can get access to all that exclusive content and what separates the two apart is that if you do the four ninety nine a month, we're calling it the clergy tier. Uh, oh. You can uh, recommend videos for us, so topics that we will do. Um, we get Ooh. topic recommendations all throughout. Uh, I get emails left and right about doing topics, and sometimes we don't get to them. But what I want to do for people that financially support our ministry is to do the videos that you all recommend. So that's one of the perks of of joining us and and supporting our ministry uh, that way. Uh, go visit St. Tecon Seminary, uh, and and uh, hopefully if you're uh, seeking a higher education, that would be a place where you wow. could do that. And so with that being said, again, Dr. Ford, thank yeah. you so much. I really appreciate you, and I appreciate you, what you're doing wow. for the Orthodox Church. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tyler. All righty. With that being said, everyone, I hope you have a blessed day. Good afternoon. I usually say yeah. good night at this point, but <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, take care and know, know for a fact that you are loved.